So disruption in the airline industry. You know, I have a confession to make, and my confession is this. I have had for many, many years a secret love affair with the aviation industry. And I don't know why, there's absolutely no reason why that should be, other than maybe I could consider the fact that our house, uh, where the house that I grew up in, in Stavanger, happened to be right directly in the flight path of Sula Airport. So every night and every morning, sort of instead of having an alarm clock, we could just listen to the Vidre flight come in, in and out. And it used to be a game as a child, I used to sort of listen to, to aircraft noises and say, ah, that's an Airbus, or that's an F-100, or that's a 737. So I was very excited to take on this little, uh, in the next few minutes, this presentation on disruption in the airline industry. And we have a couple of highly qualified uh, contenders to participate in the debate. Uh, following my short presentation. So, disruption. What is it? What does it mean to be a disruptor in aviation? Well, it, it can mean a lot of different things. But what appeals to me personally is the fact that those companies that have been able to be successful in this industry, disrupting it, they have certain key characteristics in common. And we'll discover what they are just in a couple of minutes. The second question that I seek to answer is, for all of us as investors in this room, who will be the winners following the, these uh, real changes that are in, um, in the process of working themselves out? Well, let's see. The industry itself has been extremely resilient to all kinds of crises, wars, you, you name it. And that is not necessarily the picture one gets from reading the media headlines these days. But if you take a snapshot of the industry for the last 47 years, we see a constant growth of roughly 5% per annum, very steady. And even in those, uh, given those periods of interruption, such as, remember the, uh, the uh, epidemic of SARS in Asia, you saw a temporary blip since 2003, the fact is the revenue per passenger kilometer traveled, this is the way of measuring traffic, just volume worldwide, has grown 85%. Quite remarkable. And at the same time, airlines are filling up faster, they're flying more hours, there are more hours in the air, and those are the hours that have really determine profitability of an airline. And the next time you find yourself cramped back, jammed back in a seat, and your knees are up to your elbows, basically, you can then thank the airline industry for being able to load up more people on each aircraft. And that has a significant impact on the profitability of airlines. Now, the irony of all this, the irony, while all these efficiencies are going on in the industry, if you look at all the different players in the airline industry, er everybody from airport operators to aircraft manufacturers, engine and manufacturers, service companies, you name it, all of these players have been able to make money over time. The only, only piece of the puzzle, and ironic as it is, the airlines have found it harder and harder to make money in this industry. And why is that? There has been a relentless pressure on pricing. If you go over the last five, 50 years in this industry, prices have been trending down. And that continues. So the name of the game is going to be efficiencies and really driving down operational costs per unit because this is a effectively a fixed cost industry. So it's all about efficiency and cost. Now, uh, skipping quickly over this last slide, I think it's interesting to note the different outlooks. This is the International Air Transport Association um, view of the world for 2016. Very interesting that the United States is making up about half the profitability of the global basis. And they're also making up two times per passenger. It's t twice as profitable for an American airline on average as it is 
for a global airline on average. That means there is a lot of growth and a lot of room for increased efficiencies and profitability, especially in regions like Asia, which we'll see in a few slides. So how is this demand going to be met? Supply is basically uh, meeting demand where 5% of the projected 6 to 7% growth going forward the next two, three years will come from replacements or industry growth, excuse me, organic growth. The rest, uh, the two, the one to two, three percent, give or take, depending on whose forecast you look at, will come from replacements in the industry. And underlying all this, as you see in the graph from uh, Boeing, over the next uh, few years, until 2034, there will be roughly 38,000 uh, aircraft demand in total. 16,000 of these will be replacement. So these will be just simply older aircrafts being phased out, and 22,000, uh, the balance, will come from pure growth. And looking at where this growth is going to come from, interestingly enough, Asia, not surprisingly, emerging markets, big driver, six times uh, as many people in 2014 flew in emerging markets as they did in developed markets. And it's also not coincidentally that the growth in this region is roughly 6% vis-à-vis uh, -vis the 4% projected growth in developed markets. So clearly, room for growth. And if you ask the average CEO for airlines, not surprisingly, again, big economic power shift is going to be those variables that are going to drive and determine which region will be the stronghold and the growth engine for future um, growth. Now, low-cost carriers actually existed way before um, I think most of us started flying in this room, at least. Has anybody here heard of Transocean Airlines? It's actually one of the first low-cost carriers in the United States. And the airline operated in the 40s, and CEO Captain Nelson had a very, very simple vision. We fly anything, anywhere, at any time. Now, think about this vision. Now, that's certainly entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial but it's questionable whether or not sort of, this is a viable, long-term, profitable strategy. Now, listen to this. As an example, a DC-4, a DC-4 Transocean Airlines, and by the way, they had tables and curtains on the low-cost carriers in the 40s, by the way, which is, this, this uh, picture happened to be taken in the 50s, but uh, very interesting to note that uh, things, meals were being served on uh, silverware and on, uh, with linens, and people actually did dress up to fly in those days. But this strategy was very interesting because in the 40s, what happened, a DC-4 flew from California, from Oakland, California, to Taiwan with 12,000 uh, kilos of gunpowder to support General Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalist general in Taiwan at the time. Turned around, then flew to Hong Kong, picked up some cedar chests, flew to Rome to deliver these cedar chests, picked up some sailors, and flew these sailors to meet their ships in New York City. Now, that was entrepreneurialism. Unfortunately, the airline went under in 1961, and this was one of the Stratocruisers, which was a Boeing 377 that was a typical um, aircraft in the fleet at the time. So an interesting little historical tidbit on uh, disruptors actually existed in this uh, industry for a long, long time. However, the term disruption uh, didn't appear on the internet, it seems, until 2007, when it became in vogue to talk about disruptors, not just in aviation, but across industries in the world. And what does it really mean to be disruptor? It means two things. It means that you have a business model that's different, and that allows you to go after a segment of the population, or clients, that the incumbent does not deem to be attractive, very simply. And criteria number two is that you have the technology in place to make that happen. And why don't the incumbent 
react? Well, remember, if you're going after that kind of segment of population that is not deemed to be attractive, it takes some time for the incumbent to catch on. Other than looking at cartoons, I figured we could also look at a more serious graph, which is put together by Harvard Business Review, which shows then the, the stratospheric market tiered in three different segments. You have the less profitable, the sort of medium, and the high-end profitability. And in comes the disruptor. The disruptor comes from underneath, gathers up technological know-how, and then, given that know-how, cuts through to the segment um, that actually cuts into the core of the incumbent. And by that point, it might be too late to start reacting. That is the business model. Now, this is what happens when you do animation late at night. <laughs> we uh, worked on this for a while, and I'm not sure how it's working. But uh, sus, there's usually one event that makes it possible for an, in, in, uh, for an entrant to come into a market. And that is in, in SUS and Norwegian's case, and Norwegian is, a, is certainly a holding in, in Skagen, that was a merger between Bortens and SUS in 2001. And before then, Norwegian really was just a, a regional airline, primarily on the west coast of Norway, taking over the, um, uh, of a, an old fleet um, at the time. But the interesting part is that given the merger and given the fact that there were certain contracts in place, it enabled Norwegian to, to merge from a primarily regional player into a national player, going head to head with the most profitable and most sought after routes within Norway. And then the story goes on. Most of us know the story. On came the, the long haul uh, flights and the, the company took off. Now, AirAsia, which I'm very happy to say we have uh, the CEO with us here today, is another great example. Another great example of an airline that has successfully started from uh, virtually zero. Listen to this. Uh, Co-founder Tony Fernandez, who um, in 2001 uh, came in and said, well, listen, there is an airline here in Asia. There's about um, 200 employees. We have about 11 million of US uh, debt. How much would you be willing to uh, pay for this fleet? Fleet of 20, by the way, 20 aircrafts. And Tony said, well, I'll, I'll buy it for a token one ringgit. One ringgit at the time was 25 cents. He got himself an airline. So that was the birth of AirAsia. And AirAsia, uh, against all odds, against those humble beginnings, are now the number one player in Asia, the fastest growing region in the world. And we'll hear more about that from the CEO uh, when she comes on. And in 1994, when you consider the fact that less than 10% of global flights in the world were represented by low-cost carriers, that number now has proliferated um, rapidly. And in the world today, these are uh, 2013 numbers, so slightly stale. I think that number is closely to th closer to 30% globally now, occupied by low-cost carriers. And it's fascinating because it's, it's really taken off even as the, the overall industry has sort of a flattish growth. Southeast Asia obviously leading the, the pack here, um, where, and it's, it's going to continue, and there's a demand for it. And part of that demand is coming from the fact that there will be a lot of new people entering into the middle class over the, the next few years. We project, and this is not our projections, this is Oxford economics, projection of the middle class essentially doubling between now and 2034. And that's quite significant. What does that number mean? It means that 2 billion are in that bracket now. That's going to grow to about 4 billion. That means that every day, Roughly 290,000 people, 290,000 people enter into the middle class every day. And those are the people, and this is sort of the definition of what is middle class. Middle class is earning roughly 20 to 150 thousand dollars a year. Quite a significant number, and that's where the demand is going to come from. People want to travel, people want to see the world. 
they don't want to be confined to uh, their region. And to put this into perspective, Telenor's inside capacity, I read, is 23,000. So that's way more than 10 times, if you take the, the projected 10-year number, way more than 10 times the capacity of Telenor Stadium entering middle class every day. Now, there's a big divergence between um, uh, airlines and how they performed over, over time, as we can see by the represented low-cost carriers here. And part of that has to do with the spread and valuation. Uh, uh, we have highlighted here in orange the holdings of AirAsia and uh, Norwegian, which we hold in Skagen. And I think a big reason for that is to what degree overregulation will play a part in costs. Um, regulation imposes direct and implicit costs on airlines, and that is, in CEOs' mind, the biggest threat and the biggest risk, therefore, in the industry today. We also see that, given the fact that yields are under pressure, that means pricing is under pressure, what do airlines have to do? Well, they have to control costs. So you want to be at the left side of this curve. You want to be a play or with the potential of being at the left side of this curve. And those will be uh, in, a, in a very good position to win the game going ahead. And as with any entrepreneurial culture, mistakes will be done and will be made over and over again. Um, and I think the ability to handle how you handle these mistakes is certainly going to be the defining criteria for who is going to be the winner in this race. And so Richard Branson has his own way of defining that. I think one of his, one of his bigger mistakes was to enter into a bet with a CEO and co-founder, Tony Fernandez of AirAsia. And the bet that they did was who will win the Abu Dhabi Formula One race in 2010. Guess who won that uh, bet? Uh, certainly not <laughs> Sir Richard Branson. The loser, they agreed, whoever lost the bet was going to work one full day as a female flight attendant at the, uh, at the winning bettors airline, own airline. So here we have Sir Richard Branson on an AirAsia flight. Now, big, big conclusion here is who will be the winners? Who can we look for as some of the leading contenders in this race of disruption. I think there's four main criterias. You will have to have a strong management with a, with a pure vision of what the airline will do and what they'll be, what the future will be. You, in that culture, you also have to foster a certain degree of creativity and risk-taking by employees and the daring to think differently. I think costs, certainly, as we discussed, will be a huge uh, advantage, but that is really le more tangible than the fact that the culture has to be there as a fundamental pillar to build on. And finally, having the scale, the distribution network, and the financing available will be able to set the winners apart from the losers in this race. And with those words, I thank you so much for the attention. And I will then give the word next to, uh, and very proudly introduce, our next speaker, who is the CEO of AirAsia. Her name is Irene Omar. And Irene has spent many years at AirAsia. She's played uh, an integral part, not just in, uh, she started in investor relations. She has experience from corporate finance and head of uh, treasury, regional treasury. So she has a broad and vast experience with her and one of the few female Asian CEOs. I'm very, very proud to introduce Ms. Irene Omar. <laughs> 